Okay, we're now connected with uh, Roger Baker in Texas. Let me first give a brief introduction of Roger. Roger is the SVP of Strategic Analysis at Stratfor, a think tank specializing in security issues and custom intelligence services. Roger will first spend roughly about 35 minutes on the political state of affairs in Russia and Ukraine, and then we'll open the Q&A floor uh, to everyone here. Uh, please note that we will be using the Slido app to connect your questions with Roger. So please kindly key in your questions through that app. Uh, the QR link is basically flashed onto your screens uh, right now. Right, so without further ado, Roger, the stage is yours. Thank you for having me, happy to be here. Um, what I'm gonna do today is talk a little bit about um, uh, Russia, what's going on in Ukraine, but also try to put that into its broader context and play it out to think about what impact that's having on the world system and ultimately what impact that may ripple back down into uh, and around ASEAN. And so to begin with, I would like to put it in, into its broader context. Um, we do not believe that the world is moving back into a bipolar structure. We do not see that the US and China are going to fragment and separate apart at the same depth and the same level that the United States and the Soviet Union, that the West and the Soviet bloc did during the Cold War. Rather, we see the world moving into a much more traditional multipolar structure, a world where China and the United States may be the largest um, competing powers. Russia continues to have a certain strength and heft. The European Union has its own heft. And lots of other countries are able, or groupings of countries are able to maneuver and move within that space and move around within that space. And so that's going to be an important way to think about the implications of what's happening in, in Ukraine on the rest of the world, because it's not about being forced to pick a side. And we've seen that very actively in the responses of countries from around the world in, in a very wide range of reactions to how to deal with Russia, how to deal with trade, um, continued uh, relations with Russia during this time. And the same question is going to be applied clearly to relations with China and the implications there. If we think about the crisis as well, it's not a crisis that happened alone or outside of any frame of time. This is a crisis that has occurred on the backs of several others that have all been impacting uh, the way in which the global system works. You can go back to the global financial crisis. You can go to um, the US-China trade war. We have COVID, which is still not uh, ended. And then we have uh, the China or the Russia-Ukraine crisis. And each of those moments has reawoken multinational corporations or even smaller companies that have international exposure to the risks of extremely slim and extremely focused supply chains and the need to diversify away from those very, very focused and very tight supply chains. And at each reinforcement of this, there is a, a greater and greater um, recognition by companies that they're going to have to take on the added cost that's necessary to put in true supply chain resilience. And we're start starting to see that play. ASEAN is one of the locations that's key, uh, key for any of that expansion, particularly any of the adjustment of supply chains out of China, but it's not alone. One of the challenges that we have is, of course, that the impact of COVID is still not fully seen and it's not equal internationally. So certain countries have been able to open, reopen faster than others. China is holding to a zero COVID policy and it's going to be much slower in its reopening. Internally, the Chinese zero COVID policy puts a high premium on control at the local level. That means that local governments consistently will react or even overreact to the perception of a COVID outbreak within their particular geography. And the planning over the next year or two still with China is going to be difficult because of the randomness or seeming randomness of shutdowns. Instead of being a national level, it's going to be localities. When Singapore or when, when Shanghai shut down, it had a particular ripple. 
We now have questions about uh, uh, potential shutdowns at, at a place that is a key rail connector into Central Asia that can start to impact supply chains there in a way very different than the port supply chains get impacted. And so the Russia crisis sits on top of all of these. Now, why did Russia pick this particular moment to move? I would argue there's a few things that we want to bear in mind as we think about the Russian activity within Ukraine. Number one, let's consider the way that for, for centuries Russia has viewed the world. It doesn't view the world the way our normal maps show it. It views the world from this perspective. Um, the Arctic has forever been a wall uh, backstopping Russia. And as Russia looks out, it has large plains to the west, large plains to the east, and it doesn't see any strategic buffers um, until it pushes down to the Carpathians, until it pushes down to the Caucasus Mountains, until it pushes past the Urals and out to the Tian Shan Mountains and all the way out to the Pacific. This is the way the Russians view themselves. For the last 10 to 12 years, Russia has been, aside from perhaps the Pacific Islands, the country most aware of the impact of climate change on strategic security. And as the Arctic has opened up, what had once been a wall protecting Russia from maritime powers around the world, like the United States and the British, is now a giant open space that leaves Russia tremendously vulnerable. It also gives Russia access to more resources. But again, it's a space that has very limited population along that new maritime frontier and conceptually um, breaks the old concept of Russia as a heartland power inaccessible by maritime democratic powers and now leaves it at having a weak spot along its back end. Secondarily, the Russians have been watching demographic crises internally, um, and they see a time coming 5, 10, 15 years down the road where they're going to have a major crunch in human capital and human capacity, and they want to secure that what they see is their necessary frontier before that happens. A third thing to think about um, as we look at that is their perception of the West, both in the middle of the COVID crisis and in its current political state. When the Russians made the move on Ukraine, they did not anticipate the ability of Europe to pull together in a cohesive whole or the ability of the Europeans and the United States to pull together in a cohesive whole and a cohesive response. And the fourth piece, quite frankly, is bad intelligence. Um, clearly, the Russians misunderstood the dynamics on the ground in Ukraine. And you can see that from uh, you know, the violation of Russian strategic doctrine in the way in which they moved troops in, um, their anticipation of rapid maximalist success in moving on Kyiv, uh, and then being able to force a fait accompli on the Ukrainian leadership and force them to give up the East. That plan did not work. The Russians have had a major setback. Now we've seen them shifting to what many of us anticipated would be Russian action, which is primarily keeping the fighting east of the Dnieper River and focused on uh, what Russia sees as the Russian-speaking territories and the buffer space for Russia that protects it from uh, foreign, foreign activity. And finally, whether we want to accept the Russian viewpoint or not, from the Russian perspective, their territory, their defensive sphere has been consistently encroached upon. NATO will say it's the right of free democratic countries to be able to expand um, and to be able to choose who they ally with. And that may be absolutely true, but from the Russian perspective, that wall continues to move closer and closer and closer. And if that wall sweeps around into Ukraine, it basically gives no strategic depth for the Russians to protect themselves. And that is a major crisis for the Russians. As well, it may cut the Russians off from the Black Sea and cut off their southern maritime access, another major issue for Russia from a strategic perspective. So the Russians chose this time both from a long-term strategic view that they felt they could grab this Eastern territory, hold it, and basically move fast enough that the West was left not fundamentally cutting Russia off from the international system. They also did it from some of the shorter term um, dynamics that, that we just talked about that led them to feel that they needed to move in the near future because down the road, they would not have the capacity to be able to make that move or they would be more vulnerable in other places. 
Again, clearly there's been some misunderstanding by the Russians, but we should be cautious not to count out the Russian military activity in the East and don't expect that, that the, the mess we saw in Western Ukraine is what's being replicated in Eastern Ukraine. The Russians did not use their proper force structure in Western Ukraine. So this is what's happening. Now, what's the short-term implications of uh, this crisis and, and what's going on with this, this crisis in Ukraine? Well, one of the things that, that we can think about right away is the impact on trade. Now, by some pers perspective, Russia has been pushing itself further and further into a key trade relationship with China. And as a country, China is the largest trading partner with Russia. And that has given Russia some ability to buffer itself from other parts of the world. That's primarily, though, uh, raw commodities moving from Russia into China. So that doesn't help the Russians get away from their commodity trap. And, it's, and, and down the road, it potentially ties Russia into a dependent relationship on China that's particularly difficult for the Russians to manage. But if you look um, further at trade, that China, when you take the EU as a whole, pales in comparison. A breakdown of Russian trade uh, due to the Western sanctions and secondary sanctions that are starting to be placed to limit what Russia can export, what Russia can import, is, is already having and is going to continue to have major ripples. Um, the two most obvious are um, food and fuel, right? that it is a big impact on global agricultural prices, both from the, the raw agricultural goods that normally come out of Ukraine and Russia, uh, as well as from the fertilizers that come out of Russia and Belarus. Those, the fertilizers in particular are going to have a much longer term impact uh, as everybody has to shift to be able to, to readjust. And it may have a particular impact over the next year or two uh, if there's not sufficient fertilizer moving around for uh, crop planting at this particular moment. And at the same time, we have a reduction for one year or possibly two years in crops coming out through the Black Sea. Um, on fuel, we obviously have the much higher fuel prices that we've been seeing. Um, that is uh, potentially a net benefit for, for energy exporting countries, at least in the short term. Um, but for most of the countries it's a, it, who are energy importers, this creates a major problem. The third short-term problem with this is the pressure coming from the United States and the Europeans on countries to join in on the punishment and the sanctions of Russia. And, and I put it in terms of punishment because uh, it, it's fairly clear that the sanctions do not have an impact on Russia's willingness to continue the war in Ukraine. And therefore it's designed to be a, a deterrent action for other countries in the future to know that these types of pain and these types of punishments will come, but also to punish the, the Russian leadership and hope that down the road that ultimately weakens Russia's capacity to be able to carry out further activities, or maybe at some point allows the Ukrainians to reclaim some territory. So those are some of the, the, the short-term dynamics that I think we want to be aware of. Um, Russian energy primarily goes to Europe. Uh, if that gets cut off, the Europeans are going to be drawing energy from other places. We do see the U.S. starting to step up. Um, this is going to have a long-term impact also on the LNG market. Um, and, and we may potentially see this finally drive some split between the pricing in the LNG market and the pricing in the oil market. Um, and some, that is definitely something to keep an eye on down the road. Now, in the medium and longer term, frequently we are asked, what does this do to Russia-China relations? The two questions that come out are, does, does this make China invade Taiwan? Um, and does this make Russia and China turn into a formal anti-Western bloc and potentially move us into a bipolar system? What I would look at is first, there is a major problem with Russia's actions for China's grand strategy. If you look at China's uh, strategic goals, their strategic goals have been based on the idea of being able to utilize multimodal transportation links and a variety of transit links uh, to be able to push their economic and population connections out and basically to build bridges across all of Eurasia and down into Africa and use that as a way to um, strengthen the Chinese economy and to buffer China against any potential strategic risk or strategic shock against particular 
trade routes um, or particular trade relationships. So effectively, China's strategy through Belt and Road is to build bridges. Russia is looking in a very different perspective. It's digging moats. It is building a strategic buffer chain around itself and pulling back inward. And in doing so, it has cut off or has the, the risk of long-term cutting off a lot of these key trade routes and rail routes that the Chinese have built that run across Central Asia through Russia and out through Russia and Belarus into Europe. This is pushing the Chinese to have to relook back at the southern routes um, and potentially uh, expand Transcaspian routes, um, tie themselves into uh, Turkey as Turkey tries to push back out through uh, the Caucasus states into Central Asia, um, and have China relook at South Asia and Southeast Asia as key places for bypassing um, the Strait of Malacca and, and the vulnerability of Chinese trade to that, that narrow maritime strait. That means Pakistan, um, that probably means an increase in relations with um, Myanmar uh, as well, um, as, and uh, maybe Laos, Cambodia, as China tries to build these key additional rail links or connectivity links to make those shortcuts. So that creates a stress in the Chinese-Russian relationship. On the other hand, um, there are uh, benefits to this. It tightens Russia's dependency on China, and that's uh, a key thing that's going to um, give China a little bit of extra um, strength in dealing with it. Now, the big challenge for China right now in this Russia relationship is that in the end, it's China's interior provinces, not the coastal provinces, but the interior provinces that really have not gained like the coastal provinces have from China's 30 plus years of economic growth. And as China goes through the difficult economic transition, those interior provinces are basically being told that they're going to be slower and, and much further behind than the coastal provinces, and they're going to have to wait now a lot longer to catch up. So Belt and Road was a key component of taking that interior stress and pushing it westward and allowing those people to look that way. If you close off part of Central Asia, if Russia feels threatened and starts to reinforce its security dynamic in Central Asia and push back against some of the expanding Chinese security cooperation, for example, that puts additional stress on China and again reinforces that push further south, um, looking at the Chinese southern frontier as the way to refocus internal Chinese um, labor uh, and investment flows and small and medium enterprises uh, pushing out. The second piece then gets us to the question of, um, and this was asked frequently at the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, does the Russian invasion of Ukraine now convince China that they should move on Taiwan? I would argue, no, it doesn't. Um, there's a few things. One, China will make the determination if it's going to use military force on Taiwan based on the dynamics in Taiwan, not the dynam dynamics in Europe. Um, so long as China can avoid using military force on Taiwan, it's going to do so. It's going to hold back. Um, it would rather not do that. Secondarily, um, what the war in Ukraine and Russia's actions have done has given the Chinese um, the, the very clear indication that if they are to move on Taiwan, they have to take it within a week. Um, they have to move fast, they have to move quickly, they have to hold it, and they have to be able to disrupt the ability of the West to pull themselves together and push in. At the same time, what the war has done is reinforced to the United States and other countries that they need to find ways to ensure that Taiwan is much harder uh, to invade and that it's not worth the cost to the Chinese to invade. And so we're seeing, again, some of the, the weapon systems that were approved under the Trump administration, under the Biden administration. Well, some of those deliveries are clearly being slowed. There's a, a rising recognition of the need to do that. There's a, a need to signal to China that the United States is going to intervene in a Taiwan scenario. And this does start to create a much tenser position around Taiwan. Um, because if China is going to utilize military force rather than just political and economic coercion, it may need to run preemptive strikes against US positions um, in, in the Ryukyu Island chains or other parts of the region. And so that adds another deterrent element to China that raises the bar before they make a strategic move on Taiwan. So that's something to think about. The other thing as, as we look at this um, is to, to think of 
how this impacts China's view, though, on its need or its perceived need to secure its territorial claims in the South China Sea. And so one of the interesting things just from a, um, uh, a, a social sociological dynamic is that China has started shifting from its traditional horizontal map to a vertical map of China. And in a horizontal map of China, the nine dash line is in a box somewhere off to the side and it's not seen as part of China. In the vertical map of China, it's a contiguous with China and it recreates that it perception that that is part of Chinese territory. Secondarily, we're seeing that uh, the Chinese military is becoming more assertive even further from the Chinese shoreline. And we've seen that lately in the, um, the two uh, aerial interceptions with the Canadians and with the Australians. And that type of behavior may increase. So we may see China becoming more assertive within uh, the areas of the, the South China Sea that it has declared as its own, um, particularly against uh, AUKUS members um, and any Europeans who happen to be moving within that place. And if that's the case, that may mean then that we're going to have a higher level of, of perceived tension within those waters that may ultimately have some impact periodically on reinsurance rates, on shipping, on the comfort and confidence of uh, moving goods um, through the South China Sea. So that's part of that relationship. Um, what are some of the medium and long-term impacts of Russia's um, war on, on Ukraine? Well, one of those is going to be thinking about how long do the Europeans and the Europeans and the Americans remain united in the way in which they look at this Russian action. Right now, there is still some aspect of, for, for lack of a better word, war euphoria in these countries. And that is having them consistently send additional materiel um, give moral support to the Ukrainians, increase the types of weapon systems they send within a certain constraint. Um, and we've seen that in, for example, the types of short range ballistic missiles that the United States is willing to give Ukraine and the ones that it refuses to give because those potentially give the Ukrainians the capacity to start taking the war deeper into Russian territory. And from the US perspective, that could rapidly expand the war into a Russian NATO conflict, which would completely alter uh, the way we want to think about um, the war, world trade, uh, global stability, and things of that sort. But the Europeans have temporarily pulled very close together uh, during this conflict. And we've even seen the Germans come on board. We've seen the French. Clearly, the Far Eastern Europeans have come on board. Um, even places like Hungary have backed off from Russia a little bit and tightened up their relations with Europe. Um, Poland obviously is very concerned about Russia, um, but, the, but uh, Poland had its own sort of stress with the European Union on things like uh, the judiciary. They've given that up in the, in the near term to basically tighten and strengthen that, that component. France um, really wants to create uh, a EU-wide um, defense and security perspective that's separate from NATO, even if it understands the NATO component, but really tries to define what are the EU interests and where are they. That's the case right now. But if the war in Ukraine continues at the pace that it's going now for another three months, six months, eight months, 12 months down the road, there's a question as to whether the economic issues and the um, migration issues in Europe are going to keep the Europeans united on this, or if you're going to start to see war fatigue in some of the European countries, they start focusing more on domestic issues um, with, with inflation, uh, with high fuel prices, with high fu food prices, they pull back a little bit and we may see Europe start to refragment a little. The far Eastern Europeans focusing on that NATO relationship and trying to lock the United States in there, the Western Europeans pulling back internally and relooking at internal Europe. Um, if that's the case, then uh, we start to see again those, those, that re-internalization of European priorities. Um, and Europe is less a, a strategic partner of the West in a single global context and instead starts looking more inward at the continent. 
There's also a concern that that may happen in the United States, and we're heading into the um, midterm elections later this year in the United States and only a few years away from the next presidential election. Uh, the last two presidents, both um, President Trump and President Obama, were um, continentalists and focused more on the United States here than the United States as a major um, driver of uh, world activity and a major intervener in the world. Um, that trend may pull itself back in, and you may see the United States pulling back again from that and really trying to only focus on a few strategic locations down the road uh, as it comes out of this war with Ukraine and if that war continues to, to drag on. Um, other things then that we wanna be um, aware about, uh, and my slide clicker appears to be disconnected. Give me a second here. Um, there we go. Uh, one is going to be thinking about long-term food security. So as we look at this change, um, it is not clear that the Europeans um, or the Americans are going to uh, rapidly change the sanctions on Russia, um, change the sanctions on Belarus. Once they're in place, it's very hard to remove them. And barring a, a complete collapse of, of the Russian uh, government system and the establishment of a totally new government, it's unlikely these, these constraints on Russia are lifted in the next two, three, four, five years or, or even beyond. That means that there's going to have to be a shift in where people are purchasing certain commodities from. The second piece is how long uh, does the tension in the Black Sea last? Do we get a one-year disruption of Ukrainian exports and crop cycles? Do we get a two-year, a three-year cycle? Um, so this is going to go on. That's compounded by uh, rising issues of water scarcity and change in temperature on climate in the long run. Um, but we're also seeing that the broader food security dynamic is creating localized um, social economic crises and countries are reacting by putting restrictions on exports of their own food commodities. And so we've seen this happen through ASEAN. There's some concerns that, uh, that Vietnam and India may ban rice exports for a period of time. Uh, we saw it in palm oil, we see it in chicken. These types of short-term disruptions there the more those happen, the more those become normal tools going forward, rather than tools that are anachronistic in the global free trade marketplace. And that means some fragmentation of global norms and regulations is something we want to be considering and keeping in mind um, with food security. Uh, the other is obviously energy security. There's a lot of talk about this um, driving the need to rapidly expand alternative energy. At the same time, it's also pushing uh, for uh, the resumption, at least in the temporary space, of coal um, and the dependency on localized energy sources. Uh, in the long term, this may actually finally spur expansion of nuclear power and development, particularly of um, uh, small modular reactors. Um, but it also pushes this idea of the need for the rapid expansion of green energy. The rapid expansion of green energy requires raw commodities. Um, just like the oil and gas industry required raw commodities. And that means a push toward uh, competition over where you get those commodities and where they're processed. Rare earth elements, some of those which are critical, some of uh, these uh, new energies, um, that China has a lock on the processing of rare earth minerals. Other countries are starting to get into that but it's going to take a long time to be able to change that processing cycle and make those uh, available from places other than China. This is part of why it's unlikely, for example, that there's a true bifurcation of the global economic system because China holds too much of this in reserve and there simply is no replacement for some of what China offers uh, within certain, certain key critical energy commodities. Um, it also may mean greater competition uh, for these resources between big powers. So more intense um, jockeying for access, for, for mining rights, for trying to encourage other places to get into the, the processing and reprocessing of these minerals um, to be able to run the supply chains. And that's not only going to be by governments, we're going to see it by companies. 
And uh, uh, Tesla's example in New Caledonia is a great example of a company going in and trying to lock in from Minehead all the way through the supply chain cycle access to key resources and key commodities. So another thing that comes out of this series of crises that impact um, global supply chains is the idea of more fragmentation of global supply chains into these tighter, tighter little areas of control, but also a breakdown of that concept of broader free trade. Instead, it's going to be national economic issues and national economic security driving a lot of this. And that puts us to, a, I think, a final point to talk about here. Um, and this is a trend that was going on long before this crisis. But I think that as we see this rapid series of crises, we are moving to the end of the, the extreme expansion of the North Atlantic um, Western liberal economic social model as, as the perceived inevitable norm of all countries across the world. It was never the inevitable norm, but that has been the driving force, the driving pressure that has pushed for a global set of standards, a global set of regulations, a global set of norms that all countries are supposed to ultimately follow. And that goes into the ideas of trade, that goes into the ideas of the relationship between governments, industry, and population. Um, all of those aspects, we are seeing, we were already seeing the, the limits of that and the pushback of that, but I think that these crises finally break that system. CPTPP is probably the last of the extreme uh, trade agreements. Trade agreements going forward are likely to be small, minilateral, multilateral, or bilateral agreements. They're going to be less intense. I think if you look at things like IPEF, IPEF, the IPEF is, a, is an attempt to adapt to a multipolar structure where you're not going to have countries creating these really tight links with each other where they have to have economic, political, and security relations all tied to a single country. And so the war in Ukraine has taken what was already a pattern that we were seeing and pushed it into high gear. It fragments global energy dynamics, at least in the near term. It fragments uh, global food dynamics and creates multiple crises. Um, it's compounding the economic impact of the COVID crisis. You know, there, there's a lot of talk about potential future recession, even global recession in different places. In the U.S., discussion of stagflation, uh, certainly in the European Union, um, those are rising uh, uh, challenges that may be there. And those are going to have an impact on the way in which these countries and these regions um, adapt to this multipolar system. For ASEAN, this is all about opportunity and, and, and risk. On the opportunity side, Clearly, as com uh, companies look to diversify supply chain, ASEAN has a great uh, role to play in diversification um, and in the idea of creating resiliency uh, within supply chains. Um, ASEAN is going to be a focus of intense competition amongst multiple big powers, certainly the US and China, but I would look for other um, mid-sized powers as well, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Indians, um, some of the European countries. Uh, that creates an opportunity for ASEAN to be able to shift and move and adapt within those if the ASEAN nations can find some ways to create synergy and to allow themselves to work together in a block. Um, and that's a challenge that, that countries are constantly exploiting is that differences within that. Um, and the final aspect is, as we look at this, um, the, the, there's a big question, is the Russian move on Ukraine a momentarily anomaly or does it break the, the sort of moral concept that big countries don't attack small countries anymore um, unless they're intervening for global reasons, right? That just aggrandizement of territory um, is not the way that a, that a country secures its interests. Um, that idea may be breaking down. That's a very old idea. It's an 18th century idea. It's a 19th century idea that a, that territorial uh, integrity and security comes from attacking your neighbors, not from economic tools, political tools, and utilizing um, uh, global institutions. So this crisis, while it's driving certain institutions to try to tighten up, like we're seeing in the European Union, I think it's demonstrating the final weakness of broader-based global institutions like the United Nations. And the question comes out of that in a multipolar system, where does baseline security and norms uh, come into play? Or do those start to break down and we move to a much bigger diversity 
um, of uh, ways in which countries act. And that means that predictability um, in broad geopolitical patterns uh, starts to become harder uh, to be able to assess. And I think for, for now, let's stop it there and we can go to some Q&A and some discussion to take it further. Thank you, Roger, for that uh, insight and sharing. We'll now begin the Q&A session. And the way that we're going to run this is that we'll be using the Slido platform to take your questions. So behind me and on your screens, you will be seeing this QR code pop up. Uh, kind of click onto that and it will bring you to uh, either your Chrome or Safari to basically input your questions in there. I'll do my best to basically take your questions uh, to Roger. Yeah. So as I see right now on my screen, there are some questions that are slowly coming in. And the first question is uh, around the Taiwan Straits. And Roger, if I could uh, spend a bit of time here first. The question is basically this. <clears throat> So based on what we've seen from the Russia-Ukraine war, there are some estimates that if China were to invade Taiwan, and given Taiwan's unique topography, China will need one million soldiers to mount the attack. Uh, to give some context here, in Russia, the number of active soldiers that uh, Russia controls is about under a million, 900,000, I think, to be exact. Um, and uh, they also have uh, spare access of uh, 2 million in terms of a reservist uh, armed forces. Um, Roger, what, what do you say of this? And is this uh, realistic in, in your view? So I think that um, it depends upon the circumstances, right? So if the, if the Chinese believe that they can rapidly take Taiwan and force a political solution, that they can move quickly, um, take the, the, the central leadership and the central leadership capitulate as such, clearly you wouldn't need a force of that size. Now that's probably highly unlikely. Um, a million people, potentially, uh, we have to look at, uh, unlike the Ukraine war, uh, a war in Taiwan is a war that requires you to move over water. Moving over water is going to be, um, it's more vulnerable, um, it, it's easier to disrupt, um, it's harder to move in any form of surprise. Uh, and so the, the Taiwanese are going to be actively defending uh, against that, that maritime invasion. But I think you could put the, I've seen the numbers, um, you know, in, in some cases as low as, as 300,000 for certain types of contingencies, up to that million number. Uh, a lot of it will depend on the perception of resistance. Um, and the ability of the Chinese to significantly disrupt uh, the Taiwanese capacity for resistance, and finally to disrupt uh, the West's ability to intervene or interdict during the crisis. Uh, Roger, this is, I think, also a follow-up question on Taiwan. Um, and the question here is that there, there's some talk that the US, I think there was a point that you alluded to in your earlier presentation, that the U.S. has already decided to sell Taiwan special weapons that will be likely installed by 2026. What are these weapons and how large is a deterrence factor in the eyes of China? Right. So, so I think some of the weapons that, that the U.S. Has, has previously approved that haven't been delivered yet um, are going to be the, the HIMARS um, with the ATACAM uh, missiles. And what that basically is, is it's going to give Taiwan the ability to have uh, road mobile, short range ballistic missiles that can reach across the Taiwan Strait. And so in a, in a conflict scenario, the Taiwanese would not be limited only to strike at the Chinese forces as they land, but they would be able to strike at the fuel depots, at the loading depots, at the docks, um, at some of the airfields inside China, at least along that coastal strip, and be able to significantly disrupt um, Chinese activities uh, to be able to move onto the island, um, onto Taiwan. So those are our key systems. And then in addition to those, there's some um, uh, land-based harpoon missiles, uh, anti-ship missiles uh, that the, the Taiwanese are looking to get from uh, the United States as well. 
these don't fundamentally stop a, a Chinese action, but they add cost um, to any Chinese invasion because they give Taiwan a capability that it doesn't have now and a capability that can, that can significantly disrupt what is already a very complicated uh, plan for a massive amphibious landing. Thank you. Um, Roger, the third question is on uh, America's upcoming uh, midterm elections, or actually the, the, the next uh, big one. Uh, will its position change? It's, will its position on Russia change? if either Trump or the Republicans win the next election? I don't think that there would be a significant change in the view on Russia if the, if the Republicans win or, or even if Trump comes back in. And one of the things that we saw is despite um, uh, former President Trump's, um, you know, the, the, the perception that he was friendly to Russia, that he was interested in better relations with Russia, um, domestic dynamics kept that constrained and restrained. Um, I don't think there is a large amount of support within the Republican base to suddenly embrace Russia after what, what is perceived as naked aggression um, in Ukraine. What may happen, though, is there could be a, a reduction in um, the willingness to accept the economic cost or uh, contrarily, a determination by a, a Republican administration to really significantly ramp up um, U.S. energy exports uh, to Europe and therefore U.S. domestic energy production, which would then start to push against these, the, the, the Democratic drive, uh, the Democrats drive to shift away from uh, expanded hydrocarbon production and shift to uh, new energy. So I think that that's where you would likely see it more than a, a significant change in, in how to deal um, with Russia. And I think the, the Republicans would, would be perfectly willing to continue expanding um, the, the U.S. presence at the NATO eastern frontier, you know, in places like um, Poland. Okay. Well, coming back to Russia and specifically President Putin, can you comment on the stability of his position within Russia and what's his key power base uh, uh, what does that look like, and, and is that eroding? Right. I, I don't see signs yet that Putin's power base is eroding. His traditional power base has come through a combination of places. It's come through um, the, the intelligence apparatus. It's come through uh, his relationships with key businesses um, and his ability to manage and, and keep those, you know, give those key businesses certain favors um, and, and therefore uh, manage the way in which they support him. Um, he certainly did have a, a major problem at the beginning of this Ukraine conflict, and there's plenty of um, uh, unconfirmed stories of how many uh, members of the intelligence community or his inner circle that he has had uh, uh, cleared out and removed. Um, Part of that is because he believed what he wanted to believe on Ukraine and expected them simply to, to roll over, uh, which quite frankly, the West's assessments also believed Ukraine would simply roll over with an invasion. Um, but I don't see his, his position weakened at this moment, particularly not in the midst of the conflict. Um, down the road, that may be different. Again, it depends upon how long the conflict goes on, whether he's able to consolidate gains in the East um, and maintain that hold and whether he can uh, either uh, force Ukraine to, to capitulate or um, outlast the West in their willingness to keep throwing uh, money and resources at what could potentially be uh, another endless war. Okay. There's been a lot of coverage in the media about the usage of tactical weapons. The question here from the floor is, what will stop Russia using tactical nuclear weapons? Um, especially if their intervention in Ukraine remains protracted? So I think that, that what holds the Russians from utilizing tactical nuclear weapons still um, is uh, the Pandora's box that it opens. Once one country violates the use of tactical nuclear weapons, um, uh, uh, one, they may get rapid condemnation from the Chinese even, and I don't think they're looking forward to that. Um, and two, it completely solidifies any um, US-European resistance. Um, utilizing tactical nuclear weapons right now is unnecessary by the Russians in Ukraine. The, the 
timing of potential use, though, would go to whether or not the Russians see a shift or a further expansion of U.S. or NATO um, support to Ukraine. In particular, if U.S. and NATO support um, in, in weapons or uh, intelligence sharing um, allows or encourages the Ukrainians to start pushing the war further back into Russia. And if Russia feels then that it's being um, uh, repelled from Ukraine and starting to uh, lose security of its own borders, at that point, we may see the Russians reconsider the use of tactical nukes. I think at this moment, they're primarily using them as a, as a in reserve as a deterrent to further NATO expansion um, into an, an active support of Ukraine. Great. Um, Roger, we're coming to the last question now. We are also uh, about to cut over to the next session. But this last question from the floor is about commodity supply, and I hope you can take this. Is there a channel for Ukraine to get its wheat out into the markets? Yeah, the, 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 there, there is the potential if, um, you know, there's been some talk about Turkey being able to supply some maritime lift and some maritime protection in the Black Sea to help Ukraine get it out. It's difficult for it to move by rail just because the rail lines are, are unsecure right now with the Russian conflict going on. Um, so there is a way for some of it to get out, but probably not in bulk unless there is some form of, of a temporary agreement in the Black Sea um, or, or an agreement by the, by the Turkish forces to be able to run and protect it. So I think we may see some move and the Russians may actually offer as part of negotiations uh, the movement of some of that food but I don't think we're going to see it in bulk. And then the big question is, are the Ukrainians capable of planting and maintaining the crops for next year's cycle? Thanks. Thanks, Roger. Okay, there's still a lot more questions, which I'll try my best to basically flow it through the next uh, session, uh, which is on China. Uh, so at this moment, uh, we will be cutting over to the next uh, feed at this moment. And I would appreciate those who are joining in uh, via virtual rooms to actually uh, move into the next session uh, as I speak. Thank you.